Welcome back. Today is where we're going to talk about vaccine preventable diseases. This is lecture three and now we're finally starting to get into some of the more interesting topics. I know we did a lot of definitions the last couple of uh, lectures and now we're going to start moving into actually some of the actual material of the course that relates to how we actually prevent diseases, how we treat them, and vaccines are one of the first things that you would think about when you think about massive public health programs. We'll get into some of them as, as the, throughout this uh, lecture. Um, but before we start, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please remember at the end of this week, uh, this weekend, you can uh, submit your journal club or your uh, research article critique. Again, um, this research article that you're picking is one individual article and you're basically just reviewing it, um, not giving me a repeat of what, what happened, but rather what their, what their strategy was, why they chose it, and what you think you could do to improve that particular strategy within that uh, research article. It does need to be a uh, operational study or a um, uh, uh, research study, but it does not necessarily, it, and it cannot be a review, uh, because basically you're reviewing what other people reviewed then. Makes sense anyway. Um, so it needs to be a uh, primary research article. What um, what I'd like to do with that is, is basically uh, use that as the basis if you want to. You don't have to, but use that as the basis for your uh, disease specific paper. You can use the same uh, disease for your major paper that you're going to write. So you don't have to choose different diseases. You can actually build one step on the next as you move along with this process. Um, and that way, you know, I can see the consistency in how you actually work your way through these different things. Um, again, that's due this week. And then I'll give you a, a little bit of um, more information on the disease-specific spe uh, disease paper as well as the uh, major paper that you need to write. And I'll post those online as well. But let's move into the vaccine preventable diseases a little bit. So for the vaccine preventable disease, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction and some history. Then we're going to talk about the current approved vaccines, vaccine safety, vaccine delivery, some of the policy implications of vaccines, and then some of the eradication programs that exist that are currently using vaccines. The eradication programs, I'm not going to talk about a lot, only because I have a complete lecture on that. So I want to basically uh, dedicate the entire lecture for the uh, eradication programs. So what is a vaccine? A vaccine, very simply, is a suspension of live or killed microorganisms. It can be the organism itself or it can be a portion of the organism, such as a toxin, um, uh, as an agent that's presented to the potential host, the host being you or me or any other person, to induce immunity to prevent that specific disease caused by the organism. Basically what you're doing is you're using a live or dead um, infectious disease um, that the, if it's live, it's basically weakened to cause an immune response as if it was a natural immune response. Um, and then so that way when you actually encounter the real pathogen, you've already got immunity built up against it. Um, many of you probably already know this, so I'll just continue moving on. Uh, the history of vaccine development is quite interesting. Edward Jenner uh, was the first person to actually realize the potential of what a vaccine was. He didn't create a vaccine anymore uh, in the traditional sense of actually engineering it. But he basically, what he did was, is he noticed that milkmaids um, that contracted cowpox, which is a very similar agent uh, to smallpox, they did not get smallpox as if they, when they were um, infected or if they were in populations that had it. Um, in, in 1796, he actually designed an experiment which he took cowpox infected material from the hands of a specific milkmaid um, and used that to uh, vaccinate an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps. This was the first inoculation uh, using a cowpox, and this was technically not vaccination. Uh, it's called variolation or um, in the traditional sense. Um, and then he basically challenged that boy deliberately by inoculating him with smallpox, uh, and he did not become infected. Uh, as many of you are aware, um, ethics violations today would not allow this to happen. Uh, HIPAA uh, and various uh, ethical review boards would never allow this type of experiment to happen because you can't infect a person with, with live smallpox or any uh, deadly disease. Having said that, some of the not deadly diseases you can still do uh, various vaccination uh, um, research on in which you actually challenge them with the infectious agent. For instance, uh, what you can do is, is you can uh, give a vaccine against malaria and then uh, challenge them with chloroquine sensitive malaria. So you already know that there's a drug available that could cure them uh, if you actually get infected. So in the study, if you give them uh, the vaccine, 
um, and then you give them the, the live, fat, live uh, malaria parasites, if they develop malaria, you can give them chloroquine and the malaria would go away. So you can treat them and cure them of the disease quickly before it becomes a problem. That's one of the few ways you can still do those. Even those require massive amounts of, of ethics uh, consideration using IRBs, uh, institutional review boards, to approve those type of things. And we won't get into the specifics of that, but it is something you have to think about when you're doing the research components of this. There are a lot of different types of vaccines. They come in different different uh, formulations. And the major ones are live attenuated organisms in which basically the live um, virus or the live bacteria is uh, weakened so that way it does not cause the strength of the immune response, uh, the strength of the disease that it would normally cause. In many cases, it doesn't cause any disease at all. It's so, it's so weakened. Um, the in it, but it does cause an immune response because all of the proteins and the antigens are still there. So you, when you get challenged with the wild type, the live virus or live bacteria, uh, which is the pathogenic one, it will uh, basically give you that immunity. Uh, in many sim similar ways as the inactivated and killed uh, organism um, does the same thing. However, the inactivated and killed organisms have, you know, has its pluses and minuses. It cannot cause a disease. The potential for a live attenuated to basically reactivate into a wild type or infectious is possible. With a dead one, it doesn't do that at all. It can't do that. The problem with the dead killed ones uh, or inactivated ones is that they are um, less pathogenic and less immunogenic. So you basically have to get a stronger immune response. Many of these require booster shots uh, to be able to get the full immunity. And then you have various other combinations. These are the newer, uh, newer versions of, of different vaccines called uh, cellular fractions. You can do uh, polysaccharide fractions. You can do um, cell components. Uh, and then you also have recombinant ones, uh, which are engineered uh, using back engineering the, the uh, DNA sequence of them and then creating the proteins uh, synthetically. So there's different types of vaccines, and you know if you're more interested in the science of the, how they're developed, uh, there's courses on that. Uh, actually, I do teach a class on that. If you're interested, we could discuss it. Um, and on Blackboard, I'd love to hear anything comments you have. But moving on, so what is the global status of immunization? Each year, 130 million children are born in the world. 91 million of them, almost 70% of in developing countries. Uh, almost 30 million children have no access to immunization, so that's almost half of all, or a third of all children um, never get access to vaccination. So it's a massive problem through it in the developing world. However, due to immunization, and particularly the Global uh, Program for uh, on Immunization, or EPI, which was launched in seven, 1974, 3 million lives are saved each year, and 750,000 children are saved from disability. Uh, having said that, there's still a lot of work to go on this, um, and it, it is moving forward. Um, and we'll get into some of the details, and I'll discuss EPI a little bit more in detail as well. So some of the diseases that have uh, available vaccines available include uh, bacterial diseases, um, and most of these have a uh, goal to control disease. They're not elimination programs. They're not eradication programs. Uh, in many cases, because they either have vectors uh, or or um, that are difficult to to, uh, to get rid of, such as um, um, such as trachoma with the flies that can carry it as well. Um, but also they can be found in soil like tetanus. So it's, there's a lot of different environmental factors that actually can uh, um, prevent it from being able to um, uh, be eradicated or eliminated. Um, there are a couple that can be eliminated or eradicated, and those include like diphtheria and Haemophilus uh, influenza B, also called Hib B. Um, and those those ones have an eradication uh, ability. However, there's no eradication program for them yet. They're, they're on the list, but there's they're, they're, uh, still a lot more work to do before they can actually get um, strategically uh, and logistically the ability to do that. Um, but as you can see here, I'm not going to go over the list individually, but uh, there's plenty of bacterial diseases. And there's also many different viral diseases. Uh, the viral diseases have a lot longer history of developing um, vaccines for. Some of the earliest ones are uh, viral programs, uh, viral diseases. And some of these diseases are actually targeted for eradication. Specifically, polio is the most recent one. Um, and measles is close following behind that. Uh, those particular diseases will probably be eradicated, uh, hopefully in the near future, or more likely the uh, not so distant future. Um, but there's also plenty of viral diseases out there, and there's a lot of research going on on a lot of different uh, diseases that have no vaccine yet, but hopefully will, ha will be online soon. 
even with the uh, vaccines available, the global impact of immunization on, on vaccine-preventable diseases, uh, basically all of these diseases have the ability to prevent many different diseases. Uh, all of these vaccines have the ability to prevent many different diseases. Uh, uh, hepatitis B, measles, uh, the number of preventable cases are in the millions in many cases, in the hundreds of thousands. And polio right now, uh, because it's so close to eradication, the entire global polio eradication is uh, preventing about a thousand cases of polio a year. So you're, when you think about this, your hepatitis B, the cost benefit that you're getting per case averted, is much better than polio. But it, so, from an economic point of view, if you're not looking at this from a long-term point of view, but on a yearly point of view, it makes much more sense cost-effectively to prevent hepatitis B than it does to polio. Looking at the larger scale and the more long-term effects, polio makes more sense because if you can eradicate it from the world, it'll never come back. And you can actually stop the eradication uh, vaccinations programs like they did with smallpox in many ways. So now no one gets vaccinated with smallpox. The, uh, cost, the cost benefit is infinite for that. So that's the reason why a lot of these programs actually have uh, eradication-based programs. The burden of global vaccines um, has actually um, been reduced over the years, uh, but you can actually see here there are still many many cases, even with the uh, vaccines out there, that children are dying. Um, you can see uh, pneumococcal disease kills 700,000 uh, children a year, um, rotavirus 500,000, and so on. And so children are still dying. The total about 2.5 million deaths per year from these from these six diseases. Uh, that are preventable, but the, the children are not getting vaccinated. So if you can actually vaccinate 100% of the children, you can prevent another 2.5 million deaths per year. And this is just a slide on, a, this is in the United States, but this can be, you know, if you have 100% to your very high coverage rates, you can assume this to be any country in the world. And what's interesting is, is that um, for almost every disease that, that exists that there's a vaccine for, you get almost 100% reduction in disease burden. This is amazing. No other global health program can tout this, that you can actually treat a person once and the entire, treat a community once and the entire community will be free of the disease or a whole country or a whole region or the whole world. Um, and you can see like for diphtheria, 100, almost 100% 100 change in number of cases uh, between 1921 and 1996, that's a long time period. But for instance, if you look at congenital rubella, it's only been you know, 50, 30 years they were able to reduce from 20,000 to two cases, 99.99% reduction, um, and so on. And it, it, these numbers, you know, for every single uh, vaccine can actually be repeated. It's quite interesting. And as a result, you can see that the global trends in child morbidity uh, and mortality, I should say more specifically, um, have been re being reduced since the 1970s as the EPI program has been installed. Um, EPI can take a lot of credit for this. This is UNICEF's numbers from 2009 um, and various projected numbers up to 2015. Uh, that number is fairly close, but uh, we have to wait until probably 2017 to see if that 4.3 is actually realistic. Um, having said that, uh, the numbers are going down. Again, um, the vaccines can take some credit for that, probably not all the credit, but a fairly significant amount of it. Also, as you can see, the target groups don't just uh, target the uh, children. There is very different uh, classifications of who gets targeted for which individual vaccines. For instance, newborns, uh, once you're born, you'll get Hep B, DBT, polio, and BCG in developing countries. But And then you'll get often boosters for some of those diseases. Um, and then uh, as you come, as you get older, as you enter school, as you become an adult, you get various boosters and various new, new uh, vaccines. Some of these vaccines may not necessarily be um, uh, instituted in every country, so you have to be aware of what country's specific vaccines are required, uh, and each individual Ministry of Health determines that. Many different Ministries of Health will either follow the United States or they might follow WHO guidelines, and we'll show some of that in just a minute. But just be aware that uh, it's very country specific which groups get targeted for which vaccine at, at given times. However, they are often based on recommendations by various boards um, that, that are certified to do that in the WHO um, or through other governments and that they will basically listen to, or they're even their own government. 
Just as an example, uh, for the United States, the immunization uh, schedule is the term that they use, is the schedule. So at what point in time do you get each individual vaccine? And you'll see here that at different times, um, the, the vaccines are given um, at birth at one month, at two months, four months, six months, 12 months, and so on. Um, and the schedule can get pretty complicated and complex. Um, in the United States, or in the developed world, it, um, you know, it's relatively easy to go to your uh, primary care physician or your pediatric uh, pediatrician to get these vaccines. However, in the developing world, you have to be aware that in many cases, the, the mother has to travel you know, by foot, uh, walking um, 10, 20 kilometers to get to the local health facility to get those vaccines. So it's a big ordeal. So as complicated as this is, it needs. The, there's many situations where they try to make it as simple as possible. So the WHO has these guidelines, and this is for routine child immunization. Again, there's many different vaccines, um, but as you can see, the uh, the doses at which they get them and the time, the amount, the interval between times, is a little bit more flexible um, so to give the to give the parents a little bit more flexibility to come to the healthcare facility. And they also try to use um, many different combinations of vaccines uh, that that aren't used necessarily in the United States or the developed world. Um, you can see here that uh, oral polio and uh, inactivated polio. I'm um, going to talk about polio in another discussion, but uh, you can see those two different types of polio vaccines. And they have different purposes and different time periods where they're used, and they have different abilities. Um, so I mean, it's, it is a very complicated uh, schedule. Um, regardless of whether you're in the developed world or in the developing world. And they need to be adhered to fairly specifically to get the most uh, uh, efficacy of the vaccine. Boosters as well. Uh, you have to get boosters at the appropriate time so that way you maintain your immunogenicity or else you might become susceptible to the disease years later. So next we're going to talk a little bit about vaccine safety. Um, we talked about the individual vaccines, and some of the things that need to be considered are the possibility that the vaccine can cause the disease that it's trying to prevent. This will might happen in the situation where it's attenuated or a weakened a live uh, virus or bacteria. Uh, we discussed a little bit earlier that, that there is the potential for the virus or bacteria to either revert back to the pathogenic type, or maybe they didn't weaken it strong enough to the point where it actually lost its pathogenicity. Um, so those can actually, that's a major concern. And as a result, um, many of the manufacturers, or all of the manufacturers, I should say, are required to actually test each batch when it's made um, in a small sample to test whether, to test its immunogenicity, as well as the safety to make sure that it's not reverted back to a pathogenic type. Um, the, each individual parent has to weigh out the risks, and you'll see a lot of situations where there's concerns about things like autism or um, there's concerns about you know getting the disease and so on and, and so each parent makes the, makes the decision so our our job as public health officials is to give them the best informed information available um, the autism connections between the measles specifically but also the MMR vaccine uh, has been debunked in many ways um, many times many ways and uh, but yet still there's a major concern about measles uh, whether it's unfounded uh, as it is unfounded. There's still a major concern about measles um, creating autism, and, and the public needs to be made aware of this. So as public health officials, it's your job to basically educate the parents to make sure that they understand the true risks that exist for vaccines. And the true risks include some of these issues, such as the amount of deaths that occur. Uh, you know, looking at the measles deaths, measles, you know, the uh, number of deaths, 21% of all cases of the vaccine-preventable diseases are measles. So, I mean, it's a lot of people might say, well, measles, you know, I had measles as a kid. It's not that big of a deal, but it does kill a huge chunk of the population, uh, the people that are, the children under five years old. So it is a very serious disease to be worried about. Um, but as you can see, these are 2002 numbers. It probably hasn't changed that much in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years. So um, again, you can see all these diseases actually create uh, major problems. Um, and you know, the measles and pneumococcal diseases are some of the ones that need to be focused on. So now let's get into a little bit about the um, policy aspects of, of vaccine development and vaccine uh, distribution. More specifically, let's talk about the Millennium Development Goals. Um, Millennium Development Goals I'll be talking about quite often during the uh, course of this course. Um, and it's uh, 
It was a program that was developed in the, probably the early 1990s and has evolved over the years. Actually, the Millennium Development Goals will be coming to a conclusion this year, and they are developing a new set of goals called the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, there's a lot of flux as to what's going to be in that particular, um, those particular goals, but the general theory is, is that it will contain a lot of health aspects, a lot of development aspects, uh, um, structural development aspects, and then a lot of education aspects. So the Millennium Development Goals, I'm still going to be using this as the example because this is basically what's been done up till now. Uh, the focus in the global health community has been these goals, and the goals are, there are eight of them, and they could range in everything from education to sustainable uh, um, gender equality and so on and, and, and monetary issues. But for the vaccine specifically, um, there are four goals that have direct um, effects on the vaccine, develop, vaccine usage. Uh, cutting infant mortality is the big one, but also reducing uh, maternal mortality. Um, vaccines can prevent, if you, you know, by treating women uh, with vaccines, um, you can do it even before pregnancy when they're, when they're young. You can actually prevent a lot of issues. Reducing HIV and malaria and other diseases. So there's no vaccine against HIV or malaria, um, but if you vaccinate against other diseases, you can actually make the immune system stronger that if they come down with malaria or if they have HIV, they don't need to be worried about that disease, but also if they come down with malaria, they won't they get the double, double hit. And then sustainable environment. Um, a lot of these vaccines, you know, if you, if you have the vaccine, uh, you're healthier, you can do a lot more um, work in the, in the uh, uh, fields and so on, and you actually have the ability to produce more, and therefore, as a result, again, this is all probably secondary effects, but the environment is a secondary effect, and you can even go as far as to, say, cutting poverty and education, because if you get the vaccines, they're healthier, they can go to school more, so vaccines actually do cover the gamut of all the Millennium Development Goals, and that's a major aspect of it. So, I mean, it, and it's so cheap, a lot of these vaccines, that it doesn't, it makes complete economic sense to, to focus on these as one of the major public health interventions. So, access to immunization varies widely around the world. Again, as I mentioned before, it's fairly easy. Almost everyone in the United States or developed world has access to it. Um, but in the developed world, it gets much more challenging. The WHO has been recommending vaccinations against hepatitis B since the early 90s, um, and yet still it kills one million people each year. Um, hepatitis B is an expensive vaccine, um, so that is one of the major factors of it. But it's also, even if it was cheaper, you know, some of the cheaper vaccines like measles, it's still difficult to get to a lot of the places. They're so remote, there's you know, conflict going on, um, and so it does make a very big challenge. Recommendations for a yellow fever um, has also been made since the early days of vaccinations, and yet 30,000 people still die a year. So you can see these are still major problems in the developing world, and they do need to be focused on. So what is the global status immunization? There is no equality of access to vaccines for children in industrialized and developing world. Um, industrialized world, pretty much every child gets vaccinated almost 99%. Um, you have vaccination rates in the low end to 90%. Um, if you're getting 75% in a developing world, you're pretty good. Uh, you're in pretty good shape. But there's also disparities between rural and urban. It's much easier to get the vaccines in the urban area to the cities than it is to some of the really rural areas that can take two or three days. The roads are bad. Um, the if it's rainy season, it's almost impossible to get on them. Um, and then also the communities basically very simply don't have addresses. There are migrant migratory communities. Uh, you have a lot of uh, flux between populations and between countries. Um, there's porous borders. So it makes it very difficult to know who you've actually vaccinated and who needs to be vaccinated. It's estimated that a child in industrial receives 11 vaccines on average, while a child in the developing country is lucky to receive half that number. Um, the Again, it has to do a lot with the number of vaccines, the cost of the vaccines, the number of vaccines that are recommended per country, um, and then also access. So there's a lot of different variables involved with that. And then there's a lack of investment in research and development for new vaccines or to disseminate existing vaccines to combat the diseases that are prevalent in developing countries. Um, I work with a group of diseases called neglected tropical diseases, and there's going to be a whole discussion on that. But uh, the neglected tropical diseases, just as their name implies, um, they're 
they cause a lot of problems, but there is very, very little funding for new vaccine research. Most of the funding for vac vaccine research is either through philanthropic organizations um, or governments, U.S. government uh, and developed government supports. Um, it just doesn't make economic sense for the pharmaceuticals to actually do this because uh, the populations that receive the, would receive the vaccines if they are developed are poor populations that don't have the money to pay for it at the high prices that we expect them to. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there now that are helping to, to change that. Organizations like UNICEF, which um, would guarantee to buy the vaccine at a certain price to make it economically viable for the, for the vaccine development company to do it. Um, so there are different ways you can do this. And there's also these new things called um, uh, here, um, drug development partnerships in which the, they use private and public funding to support it. So these are there's all these new ways, the innovative ways that you can do to fund the research. And a lot of these programs, such as the diarrheal diseases, uh, malaria, TB, pneumonia, and HIV, are relying on these uh, public-private partnerships to, to manage the research and development of new vaccines. So the vaccines that exist now um, for the developing world have been started to be uh, distributed uh, through a program called the EPI, or Expanded Program in Immunization. I'm going to call it EPI. It's a program that was established in 1974 by the World Health Organization, uh, and it built on the success of the smallpox eradication. When they actually realized that they could eradicate a disease with smallpox, they said, wait, if we can do that with smallpox, we can do that with uh, pretty much every other disease. So in 1974, the WHO, uh, funded through various donors, was able to start purchasing drugs for, uh, sorry, vaccines, many, many vaccines, not just the simple ones like measles, but also a lot of the more complicated ones, uh, tetanus, um, yellow fever, and start immunizing at a, at the entire communities, not just that, but also entire countries. Working with the local ministries of health and local NGOs, they were able to actually increase the number of vaccinations from 10% to almost 80% in the 1990s. Since the 1990s, this has dropped off a little bit. Um, international donation fatigue, um, countries' uh, populations increasing faster than the donations can increase. There's a lot of different reasons why it's been decreasing. But um, as of today, 83% of the world's children have received at least one vaccine. Um, whether they've actually received more than one vaccine, again, I showed you before that, that, that actually that percentage drops off quite considerably as they increase the number of vaccines. Again, that's partially from the donor side in which it's diff the, the funding is hard, but also from the recipient side. It's easy to get the vaccine when you're a kid and you're delivering birth uh, as a mother, but then the mother would have to come back. Uh, and it's very difficult for her to come back with the newborn to get the booster shots, to get the other vaccines that are required after the birth. There's an increasing number of children in low-income countries, um, and adding new and underused vaccines is the goal of EPI. So increasing the number of children and the number of countries uh, has been the focus. Um, and basically, not rather the individual disease, but the underutilized vaccines that are there um, are trying to increase those. Some of the ones that we just discussed, like yellow fever that's underutilized, um, and even measles up to the, as, as one of the major vaccines that are being underutilized that needs to be increased. The main implementer of EPI is UNICEF, but they often will work through in-betweens, local government ministries of health, local NGOs. So they are the ones that actually will be the ones overseeing it. But EPI is a huge program, and they work with a lot of different organizations. Within the UN, they work with think organizations like the uh, World Food Program, the UNDP, but they also work with other organizations such as um, uh, Vitamin, Vitamin Angels that develop, distribute vi uh, Vitamin A, uh, various malaria organizations that distribute bed nets, and so on. There's a number of problems that have been encountered. Uh, there's a lack of public government awareness, we discussed that, ineffective program management, inadequate, uh, inadequate uh, equipment to deliver the vaccines, the truck doesn't work. So there's massive problems with structural issues with the distribution and storage of the vaccines. A lot of them have cold chain issues, um, and there's insufficient means of monitoring the program. Uh, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, even though this program has been uh, here for um, it's getting close to now half a century. Um, there's still EPI still has a lot of issues, not just limited to EPI. Pretty much any global health program will have massive issues like this going on for gener for uh, decades. Um, as as time evolves, programs evolve, it, you know, and bureaucracies evolve. It's just the nature of the way this works. 
this year, this year um, and this decade, from 2010 to 2020, the WHO has actually uh, called this the decade of vaccines. There's been this push um, within the global health community to actually um, distribute more vaccines to, to more people um, in more countries, regardless of where they live, but also to the, in the development of new vaccines. Uh, there's a massive push um, and a lot of influx in funding to using the PDPs, as I mentioned before, to try to catalyze the ability to develop new, new uh, vaccines. Um, a lot of organizations are, are focusing on this. A previous organization that I used to work with called the Sabin Vaccine Institute uh, was one of the major, one of the major um, uh, participants in the decade of vaccines, and they were working to produce vaccines against lymphoelectric tropical diseases. And then there's the Global Vaccine Action Plan. So you always have to have an action plan, um, regardless of whether you're country level, your regional level, different organization, and then also even the members of the WHO um, that are in what's called the World Health Assembly. The World Health Assembly is a, is a it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of a, uh, a secretariat within the WHO that uh, establishes what are the goals of the WHO. And it's called the World Health Assembly, and they meet every year to discuss what are the goals of it, and they call them the World Health Assembly um, uh, act, uh, member states. And all the member states basically to work to approve various action plans, and one of the major action plans that they worked to approve was the uh, va vaccine action plan, in which they want to prevent millions of deaths by the year 2020 through equitable access and existing vaccines to all communities. It's a very generic statement, I know, but it's basically a, a statement saying that the countries are now responsible. All 194 countries that, are, that signed this document are responsible for the care and vaccination of all of those individuals. So they're effectively taking responsibility for their own country to say that we will focus on these diseases and try to vaccinate all the people within our country. And the advisory group that actually focuses on which vaccines and which um, are the best to use and which who are at what ages is what's called the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts or the SAGE on Immunization. And the SAGE is a, a group of uh, scientists, it's a group of politicians that meet at the WHO once a year and discuss all the new science that exists. You know, was there a new study that says that you should vaccinate six months earlier or a new, vac you know, a new vaccine that came out to approve that? And that's effectively what the SAGE is responsible for. So access to immunization varies greatly across the world, as I mentioned before. A child in a developing country is 10 times more likely to die of a vaccine-preventable disease than a child in an industrial one. In some countries, up to 70% of the population do not receive the full set of vaccines, with the lowest coverage being in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to talk a lot about Sub-Saharan Africa during the course of this class, um, and I apologize to anyone who is from Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't mean to bully them, but it is it makes good examples. Uh, I could have easily, just as easily, used Southeast Asia, Amer you know, the Americas. It doesn't really matter. Um, but um, just because I have a lot of personal experience with Sub-Saharan Africa, I'll be using that as an example a lot. Um, in Africa as a whole, over 40% of the children are not immunized against measles. Um, a major cause of infant mortality that kills one in child every minute. We discussed the numbers before. But yeah, so I mean, it is, it, the equity is there, is not there, and the SAGE and the WHA resolutions, these are the type of things that are working to try to get that equity within these developing world countries. The other end of this that makes it much more difficult is the logistics. I've touched on this a little bit. What are the capacity of the existing delivery system? Is there personnel? A lot of times public health programs are often uh, neglected in you know, supplying them with enough personnel or vehicles uh, because they basically don't get the same publicity or clout that, uh, that some of the you know, emergency type of care gets. When I was in a country called Malawi in southern Africa uh, for a while, um, I saw that there was a bunch of ambulances. Um, none of them had tires because none. In, and basically, what ended up happening is there's no maintenance for the vehicles, so they couldn't get the you know the they couldn't be able to use the vehicles that were donated. It's easier to donate a vehicle than it is to donate money for personnel. It just you know if you're the person donating it, you want to say I gave them an ambulance or I gave them a truck, um, but you don't necessarily want to say oh I gave them funding to pay for two personnel. So. There's a lot, of, a lot of issues with that, and even if you had the vehicle, the maintenance may not be there, so the vehicle may not be able to be used. Um, does there, is there a need uh, to be expanded to accommodate new vaccines? Um, if you have a new vaccine, can they actually afford to, develop the, to distribute the new vaccine? Does it have cold chain issues? Um, what are the training needs for the, for the cold chain? You know, do you have to have uh, 
personnel trained in, in storage conditions. Uh, and then the National Cold Chain Assessment is if it's been done, uh, you know, what do you do to next steps? Is there personnel, is there management quality enough to be able to handle logistics at the storage and delivery system level? The last thing I want to touch on is the eradication and control of vaccine preventable diseases. I'm not going to get too much into detail on this again because I have a whole lecture, but because of the smallpox eradication program, they realize that, that there is the potential to eradicate other diseases. Um, some of the diseases that are listed for eradication include measles, um, TB is actually on there, but uh, mostly um, at a far distance for, uh, from now. Malaria is even on there, um, as well as some of the other tra tra uh, tropical diseases such as uh, guinea worm. Uh, measles is another one, um, but eradication is no further, eradication again, the definition for that is that there's no further case of the disease that occurs in nature. It still may be um, in laboratories, that, but it's, not, it's no longer people can actually transfer it person to person in, in, a, uh, in a community level. Um, in order to actually achieve eradication, you have to have a very strong immunization program and you have to have a very strong surveillance program. Uh, I'll talk about that in the eradication discussion, but this is basically the highlights of what the vaccine preventable diseases are and what the program's abil abilities are there. If any of you are interested in discussing vaccine preventable disease programs in a country, this is uh, one of the subjects that I find very interesting um, for you know your large paper. Um, and I'd be interested to hear about it. I'm also very interested to hear about your thoughts in the discussion board. Again, um, uh, have a great week, and uh, you know I'm looking forward to the, the discussion board.